Hi, everyone. We're so glad you joined us for another episode of the Lympha Press Educational Webinar Series. That's a mouthful, right? We're so glad you joined us. We know that you are logging on right now, and I have the pleasure of giving you the lay of the land. My name is Brenda Viola. I am with Lympha Press, and I'm happy to start out today's webinar. The webinar will end with my colleague, Alexa Ercolano, and she will be handling your Q&A at the end. So feel free to please put your questions in the Q&A. And as you're logging on, let us know who you are out there in the world. Put your names and your location in chat. We're so glad that you've given us a little piece of your day today. And it will be well worth it because we have a dynamic duo presenting on the topic of breast cancer related lymphedema treatment. Why is addressing fibrosis essential? So much will go into this. Karen Ashworth did a groundbreaking presentation and an article on this topic a few years back. And we thought it was so valuable. She said, wait a minute, there's more. I have updates to this information. So this is an updated version. And you're going to learn to identify eight of the most common types of fibrosis found in breast cancer related lymphedema and essential approaches to treating fibrosis that can impact swelling, pain, function, and most importantly, quality of life. It's gonna help you serve those that you serve your patients better and really great knowledge. So let me introduce our dynamic duo of presenters who are in Halloween garb today. Karen <laughs> Ashforth is scathingly brilliant and wearing cat ears today. She has practiced as an occupational therapist for over 40 years. She began as a mere child, I am sure, specializing as a board certified hand therapist led to her interest and specialization in treating lymphedema and fibrosis 20 years ago. She speaks frequently at academic, clinical, and professional settings, performs clinical research, and presents and publishes nationally and internationally. We always love having you here, and you always drop such wisdom on us. So Karen, thank you for being here today. And equally innovative is Leslie Bell, who is our co-presenter today. Now, you may not be able to see, she's wearing skeleton earrings in the spirit of the season. And if she were to, yes, she's wearing an apron, a skeleton apron, has skeleton stockings. She started a thriving orthopedic practice back in the 1980s, also when she was a mere child. And she co-developed the Belize Compressor Comfort Bra to meet the needs of breast cancer patients with trunk and breast lymphedema. She has devoted much time to solving the complicated problems for this patient population. And she lectures extensively on this topic as well as other medical disciplines. Okay, buckle your seatbelts. This is going to be a great, we know we have them at least for an hour. We want your Q&A. Yes, we know you're going to ask, is this being recorded? The answer is absolutely yes. And everybody who registers will receive the link. Thank you all for logging on. And now, Leslie and Karen, take it away. All right. Thank you so much. And here we go. So before we start, I want to just mention that this information that we're presenting today is for educational purposes. So we're not giving any specific medical advice because really we need to have our eyes and our hands and our hearts present when we're working with an individual. So if you do have something that um, you're concerned about that um, maybe some of the pearls that we uh, offer spark some thought, we want you to consult with a knowledgeable practitioner who can provide individualized assessment and treatment plan to um, be able to help you deal with any of these symptoms. So with that, let's just cut right in and talk about what is fibrosis. Basically, it's hardened, thickened tissue, and the normal tissue of the body becomes replaced by either a hard co collagen type tissue, which would be like in scar tissue um, or radiation fibrosis, or a soft fatty tissue that we see in lymphostatic fibrosis and different types of lipedema related fibrosis um, called SAT or subcutaneous adipose tissue. And how does fibrosis occur? Well, um, what happens is that we, um, 
all of a sudden my screen froze. There we go. It's an inflammatory vicious cycle. And there has to be um, some precipitating event where inflammation is present. And as you can see, these arrows go everywhere. So inflammation is part of the healing process, but if it goes on too long, it can actually lead to more fibrosis. Um, and that can lead to adipose tissue, fatty tissue deposited in the body, which I'll talk about in a minute, and that ultimately impairs lymphatic drainage. So you can see that any of these factors can um, create a precipitation of another one of these um, undesirable factors. So that's why this is so important. And I really found that years ago, um, when I started addressing fibrosis, it really improved the effectiveness of my lymphedema treatment. So that's the whole purpose of today. So fibrosis has a whole set of problems that can compound those patients with lymphedema. Our body has a consistent reaction to injury, which is inflammation. And as Karen said, this creates changes in the tissues. And this can have quite an impact on many things, such as all the problems that are that you see here on the screen. Um, these changes also make it harder for us to manage the patient and for the patient to manage themselves because that's ultimately what we're trying to do is get those patients to manage independently. So this is a pretty big cascade of problems from fibrosis and it makes the lymphedema much harder to control. So I'm sure most of us are familiar with these stages, but the most important thing to note here is that the focal fibrotic changes are actually happening at the, at the very beginning during, during the latency stage of, um, of lymphedema when the patient might be having some symptoms, they might not be having any symptoms, um, but there's also tissue changes that are happening just based on the change in physiology that's happened during the breast cancer treatment. Um, so we actually know that, we have known this for quite a long time and that tissue integrity, it, it's different than it was before. So this is just a visual of what these stages look like as these arms are getting progressively bigger. Um, it's, it is the presence of fibrosis that's making this lymphatic response different and different bodies respond differently for many reasons, which Karen will go into in just a few minutes. So we need to consider that multiple factors have an influence on this problem and that these patients have the opportunity to manage these changes if we uh, give them the correct information. So I'm gonna start with lymphostatic fibrosis because that is present in all stages and all types of lymphedema. And as Leslie mentioned, even stage zero. What's interesting about lymphostatic fibrosis is that that is the reason why stages two and three of lymphedema are irreversible because of this specific type of fibrosis. It's created through an inflammatory process where the high protein lymph stasis attracts fat cells, forms a fatty matrix, and turns into permanent fat tissue. It's never going to reduce. So when you see this picture, you can see that this woman has um, different sized arms and her right arm is, it's big because it's combined fat and fluid. So we are gonna be able to reduce her somewhat, but her arm has progressed in terms of um, the fibrosis and it is never going to be the same size as the other arm unless she had a procedure such as liposuction. So the other insidious thing about fibrosis is that it progresses. And that means that um, not only does it grow and become more so, but the tissues themselves become thicker and denser and more damaged, which creates a vicious cycle that then produces increased swelling. So to talk about the specific types of breast cancer related fibrosis, I've identified quite a number of different types that are in the literature. And you can see in this patient who has um, a pretty prominent scar from a lumpectomy, uh, you can also see that there is um, hyperpigmentation, which is a sign that she has had um, radiation. And in this particular case, she's healing from the radiation, but this radiation fibrosis is going to continue to mature just like her scar tissue fibrosis is going to mature. And the radiation fibrosis and the scar can take up to two years each to fully mature. So 
this is something that um, is very important, not only right after surgery, but within a few years, just to check back in and make sure that um, things are healing correctly and we're not getting a hardening of tissues. So in addition to the two types, um, the uh, surgical scar and the radiation fibrosis, as well as the lymphostatic fibrosis, there's a few other types. And these don't occur in every single woman who's had um, breast cancer, but we do see some of them commonly, such as cording, where you can have cords of tissue um, it uh, typically ranges from the axilla to the um, upper arm, but it can go down the trunk, it can go all the way down to the hand, it can be painful and restrictive. And we have lots of very effective tools, and Leslie will show you later in this presentation, how, how we can be very successful in treating this type of fibrosis. This wound bed fibrosis is less common, but still occurs with um, slow healing or non-healing wounds. And the edges of the wounds can become very hard and crusty, which can delay the wound healing. So we have lots of opportunity to help with um, softening those tissues and helping wounds resolve. The next one on the right, the seroma fibrosis. Seromas are pockets of fluid that can occur after a surgery. They can occur anywhere, not just after breast cancer surgery. But you can see that this one is starting to look like a little bit of a golf ball because this patient didn't receive prompt treatment and the fluid inside that pocket started to harden and it can actually form a very hard lump. And it can, uh, it can be very worrisome because it can almost look like a reoccurrence of cancer. And um, so it's something that it's best to treat early on. We can work on it later, but uh, yeah, this is kind of a severe one. Moving down to the lower left, we can see some fat necrosis, which occurs um, sometimes when people have a reconstruction where they transplant fatty tissue to the breast. And sometimes some of that fat tissue can die or necrose and form hard little lumps like you see here. So this is something, again, the earlier we treat it, the better. And if it's too uh, delayed, um, then these can actually be removed pretty easily with some plastic surgery. But again, early is better. In the next picture, you can see the arrow is pointing to a white area. And this woman had a mastectomy with a severe cellulitis infection after her surgery. And this area is bound down. It is very immobile and it is very much blocking her circulation. It's creating pain. It's making it hard for her to move her arm. So this is an important type of fibrosis to treat early on because what can happen with uh, infections is that if you have this infectious waste that doesn't get decongested properly, it can form this gluey plaque that then uh, impedes circulation and can create a scenario for repeat infections. Last but not least is dermal fibrosis, which we don't see very commonly except in the later stages, stage three particularly. And this patient has some hyperkeratosis on her arm because her circulation is so poor. So this is something we see a lot more commonly in legs, but um, I do include it because um, it certainly can happen with um, breast cancer. I want to introduce a key concept about inflammation, that it's something that we need to address as importantly as um, all of our other lymphedema components. Lymph stasis alone is very destructive and forms the building blocks for lymphostatic fibrosis. So there's this intertwined relationship between inflammation and fibrosis where there's a lot of different opportunities to lower the inflammatory burden, which Leslie's going to tell you about now. So these are some of the inflammation or risk factors that the body can have. And the body responds to all of these if you have a sensitivity to them, 
um, or there's a problem with an inflammatory process. So we're understanding more and more how the body responds to these subclinical allergies or, or maybe even to the inflammatory foods. We're seeing this, especially with the lipedema population that um, being able to, to manage some of these things is really helping them manage their swelling. And it makes our life easier as therapists if we can figure out um, or change the response that the body's having to things that we might either do or eat every single day. So sometimes these inflammatory processes show up as swelling first. So a patient may have an allergy to something, but it's not necessarily an allergy that causes an anaphylactic type of response, but their lymph system is responding to that and it's responding by increasing swelling. So decreasing these triggers as much as possible to inflammation will decrease the body's response to these things and it can affect how much work we have to do to control the um, fibrosis or the lymphedema that can lead to fibrosis or the fibrosis that's coming about because of this inflammatory process. So as we help the patient to enter the self-management phase, um, paying attention to these triggers will help to make their self-care easier. So these are just a few classes of medications um, that can also uh, cause problems in our bodies um, and create fluid retention. And I can tell you that I have had multiple patients in the past where we're trying all of the things that we know for lymphedema treatment, and it's not changing as quickly as we would expect it to. And if that does happen, one of the best things you can do is go back and look at the medications they're on and very carefully look at their side effects. Um, so, so remember that patients can be on these medications. So in, in terms of some other infl inflammation um, from medications, chemotherapy we know can create many side effects and peripheral swelling is just one of them. Um, and unfortunately, swelling is in that, is in that list of, of so many things. So many of our patients are on these meds for pain or depression or maybe for psychologic complications. And this adds to the problem of swelling. Even over-the-counter things can cause swelling. Karen? So this is just kind of a fun little graphic that I created because I wanted to talk about how there are things we can control and things we can't. So that little blue fish down there represents genetic factors, which are present no matter what, but may or may not be a problem. And then the bigger fish uh, represent things like maybe medication, maybe uh, eating salt, body mass, alcohol, um, different types of food sensitivities or allergies. And if we can control the big fish, then we're not spilling over in terms of uh, having a high inflammatory load. So we can see that, that um, this, this occurs in people that develop lymphedema later in life. They have the genetic factor, um, but they uh, don't always manifest it until other things cause the, the goldfish bowl to overflow. So we can bring things back in order and um, I would say that with breast cancer related lymphedema, I have been very successful in helping many of my patients put their lymphedema in remission. But part of it is having a good home program to lower the risk factor and decrease the inflammatory load. So speaking of decreasing the inflammatory load, one of the wonderful things is that all the things that we do already to help our patients with lymphedema have that effect on the body. So when we can help control the autonomic nervous system, then they don't have such um, exaggerated responses to things. So MLD has been shown to change the autonomic nervous system, of course, because it actually feels good and we're doing good things. Compression stockings, you know, reduce the swelling and also can be effective for treating, treating vagal syn syncope. Exercise is a wonderful anti-inflammatory, probably the most underused anti-inflammatory out there. And then diaphragmatic breathing, one of my favorite subjects, makes a huge difference for people and it lowers their sympathetic nervous system and autonomic system and is um, very helpful. And these are all things that don't have side effects like the medications we just talked about. So uh, in this study, lymphopress treatment had a direct influence on pain and was compared to MLD in terms of anti-inflammatory effects, because it does have the same, it does have the same effect, we're getting the same result. So this might be helpful for a patient who has to manage swelling for many reasons, um, medications included. So we know that inflammation drives pain and swelling. So giving a patient something 
like pneumatic compression, especially when they get home, to help manage that if they have a bad day or if they have an increase, or as I always say, sometimes I give them their birthday off, they don't have to wear compression stockings, but it is gonna catch up with them. So giving them something that's very effective that makes them much more comfortable can be super awesome. So let's talk about some very specific treatments for fibrosis. There are many, many, many different treatments out there. And um, we're only gonna touch on a few pearls on some of these areas. It would just take days to go through all the options. Um, but uh, we're gonna whiz through a few things and start with manual therapy. And just to give you an appreciation, there are many, many different types of manual therapy techniques. Um, we can use uh, specific types of MLD that are geared towards reducing and softening and um, making fibrosis more flexible, as well as other techniques. And what I'd love to do is to give you a pearl and say that with any of the manual techniques, um, many therapists are now using antifibrotic mediums that are um, give you traction. And so using um, Dysum, um, which uh, you can actually get online, um, it's, it's a non-stick medium ex exercise bands, um, not quite as, as um, traction-y, but good. And my personal favorite um, for patients is using gloves. It's a little harder in the clinic because they're harder to clean. So I tend to use Dysum, but for someone doing their own treatment at home, using gloves helps to um, save your hands. You don't have to push as hard because it gives you better traction. It moves multiple layers of tissues. And and um, so if you haven't tried any of these, um, these are definitely worth knowing about. Well, let's talk just a little bit more about some of the other tools that we have that will help our lymphedema patients. So in the next slide, we see lots of modalities listed there. And um, Karen and I use most of these or all of these at different points in times regularly on our patients as an adjunct to the treatment that we do already. Um, you know, I have to make an, an informed and professional um, decision when I'm treating them with these things because some of them are a little bit aggressive. You know, vibration can be aggressive, dry needling's a little more aggressive, and some of these things required specialized training. But you know, when you have when you have these tools to your um, in your box, you can use them to make a big change. But understanding when and how to use them are really, really important. Another treatment that we use um, sometimes is handheld vibration. And here's just a couple of examples of some things that use vibration. And this is a nice thing for patients to be able to use at home. Vibration can be a little bit aggressive. So if you're gonna use vibration, you wanna get this very comfortable, sort of relaxing oscillation or resonant vibration. And that way you are creating that, again, back to the um, autonomic nervous system or reducing sympathetic response. And also you're loosening muscles. And remember that a lot of this lymphatic fluid is gonna run either along the top of muscles, some of the deeper vessels go through the muscles. So anytime that we can reduce tension and tone, you're gonna to get better movement of um, lymphatic fluid when you're working on it. Full body vibration is, can be very helpful, but it's also kind of intense. Um, a lot of the lipedema patients are using this right now. And that can be, it can be really helpful again for relaxation and for helping lymph movement. Um, but you can use this in a couple of ways. Um, you know, Karen often will put the feet of the patient on a vibration tool or a vibration mat of some sort and maybe do MLD at the same time. Or I might have a patient come in and I can have them either sit on the vibration, put their feet on the vibration, stand on the vibration board before I treat them. In the, and that will also give some positive effect. And again, another tool that patients can use at home. Karen. It, yeah, and it's important just to make sure that um, if you have any problems with disc herniation, retinal conditions, joint replacements, fractures, um, acute soft tissue injury, epilepsy, hypertension, recent uh, um, myocardial infarction, um, pacemaker, aortic aneurysm, peripheral vascular disease, or recent surgery, you would want to be very um, uh, cautious about using this um, tool because it can aggravate things. 
So there's a lot of evidence for topical methods to lift and remodel scar tissue. And tapes and the silicone scar gel helps to lift and remodel scar tissue. It relieves the tension on scars, creates better flexibility, and elastic tape that you see on the left on this patient's breast has internal channels that assist with um, movement of swelling. In the middle, the silicone scar gel is pricey, but it is reusable for many applications. You can also get um, like an ointment type of silicone, but this is actually, um, you can see a clear, um, it looks like a little thin sheet of jello that just sticks right on the scar and is worn except for showering. And they work great. There's a lot of evidence behind all of these. Um, paper tape, which is used commonly post-surgically for tissue approximation, can also be used during the scar maturation phase. And I find that if I have a patient who has a scar that's pulling, that they've got a lot of pain with the scar, um, sometimes applying the paper tape for for a few weeks and I usually leave it on for a few days and have patients take it off in the shower. Um, of course, if you have any kind of tape allergy, you need to be careful, but um, most people respond really well to this. And these techniques need to be monitored pretty closely for any potential irritation and they should not be used on broken or frail skin. So here's a patient of mine who had very thick and deep tethered uh, scar in the axilla, which you can see on the picture on the left. And that's actually all the motion she had in her arm was about 90 degrees. And you can see the, the cords coming off of that. And so it was really hard for her to get her arm over her head. So one of the modalities that Karen and I really like a lot is actually low level laser. It's so valuable for the, these patients. And if you do laser before you do the manual phase of your scar treatment, it decreases the amount of soft tissue work that you need to do by probably about 50%. So just from softening the tissue, it also reduces local inflammation so, and it increases mitochondrial activity. So the healing powers of this modality, modality are really positive. Um, so softer tissue moves lymphatic fluid better. And this is a patient who had recurrent cording. And so she is someone who would do really well too with an um, axillary pillow that um, is used with the, um, the comfy sleeve, which you'll see a little bit later on in this presentation. So people who have recurring cording that it's hard to manage or have swelling in their axilla, um, the lymphopress has done a wonderful job at creating a garment that works well for these patients. But again, in tandem with other opportunities um, to change the tissue texture, you know, in some of the modalities, including laser, it can be even more valuable. Leslie is the laser queen, and um, she and I both um, will tell you that it's probably one of the most powerful tools in our clinic. You can actually see the laser that we both use because there's lots of different light therapy out there, and this is the only instrument that is FDA approved for the treatment of lymphedema because it doesn't produce heat. So um, if you're a therapist or a patient interested in using light therapy, it would behoove you to do some investigation to make sure that you're using tools that are um, safe for use with lymphedema. Yep. So antifibrotic compression garments is probably one of my favorite subjects. Um, I love using them. They're so helpful for patients. I call them bumpy pads so that or bumpy garments or something that I can um, use for um, creating um, tissue te texture changes. Um, it's different from um, well, the foam can be different from the, the, from the fabric, which we'll see here in just a second, and it helps patients with long-term management. So elastic compression has the advantage of being affordable and low profile, which is great. Um, and there are both medical and non-medical grade types of elastic sleeves out there from lots and lots of different companies. And there are also thoracic garments that help these patients um, with containment. So decongestive and antifibrotic effects of compression increase improve they improve with exercise. So extra pressure, extra movement, muscle activation next to these things actually help to move fluid even better. There are lots of brands out there. Some of them can be sized quite large, which is really helpful for many of our patients, especially our lipedema patients who find these very comfortable because sometimes they don't tolerate as, um, as significant, significant a compression as the, as the patients with lymphedema can. So this is incredibly helpful for our people. 
Um, when appropriate, I often suggest that patients use these um, in tandem with other garments. So I might be creating a toolbox for patients and they can have maybe a flat knit um, custom that I call the workhorse. They can have um, some thinner, thinner over the counter type products that might be good for work or some sort of other special occasion. And then they can have these textured uh, knit products that can also be helpful in the, with their fibrosis. So I use a lot of this, um, whether it's foam or whether it's the textured medical garments. And patients need choices. We can't just sentence them to just one opportunity for change. So being able to give them a toolbox with several things that will be helpful for them is really great. And remember, no skin likes to have exactly the same pressure on it all the time. We couldn't ever live with just the same pair of socks every single day. So um, having these options and presenting them as opportunities for our patients is, can be really important. In the next slide here, you can see a few pictures. And one of them is just showing what happens when we apply texture to the tissues. So we have peaks and valleys of pressure and then less pressure. So obviously the peaks will push the fluid into the non-pressure areas and it helps to create an increase in force without an increase in pressure so it moves fluid better. And the picture next to it, which sort of looks like a painting actually, is actually thermography. And it's just again showing you what happens with, um, with temperature. So obviously the darker lines would be the places where it's cooling more and it's a little bit cooler and the um, warmer or the brighter colors are where the, the pressure is happening. I love quilted chipped foam garments. Um, they are e exceptionally good for patients, especially as night garments. Um, they're a little bit bulkier than some of the um, antifibrotic compression garments we were just talking about or the elastic garments, um, but the chipped or channeled foam is a little more aggressive um, and it really needs to be used most of the time with some sort of external pressure. So whether it's a bandage that's going over it um, you can see on the left side, there's a, um, a breast pad right there that's often used underneath a police bra or something else that can create some um, compression to give it that extra pressure that it needs. Um, and some pet, some um, things are made to go under bandages. The, the sleeve in the center there is really great for patients um, that are fibrotic and you can put a bandage over them during the decongestive phase. That can also be really helpful. So know the difference between the garments, um, figure out where that needs to go. Sometimes the garments are named by the part that it might cover, but that's not a rule. Know that what you're really trying to do is look for a garment that's gonna cover the place that the patient needs the most help. So the next slide is one I'm very proud to say that my esteemed colleague, Karen, came up with, and she was having um, a lot of problems with patients with woody fibrosis or very thick, very hard scars. And the foam might not be um, enough pressure or aggressive enough for those sorts of patients. So she came up with the use of cherry pits, which I think is just brilliant. And that is a wonderful option. Certainly it's not a huge population that needs this, but the population that does need it, find it finds it very, very helpful. And so Joby Pack was very kind and started making some garments for her in different shapes, as you can see right here. But caution needs to be used when you, when you decide to use this, because again, it is very, it is very aggressive compared to foam or compared to those other elastic type garments. So this is, um, this is a great option. And thank you, Karen, for bringing this um, forth for us to have as a tool for our patients. Um, the next slide shows something, of course, near um, dear to my heart. This is the Belize compression bra. And one thing that's nice about this product is that it is the most adjustable bra on the market and it comes the most sizes. We think we have about 30 sizes. And so one thing that's really important about any compression is that it fits. So compression works when it fits. Compression works when it provides the best compression for the part that you're trying to compress. So when we just have you know, a couple of sizes, that might not actually work for all people. So looking for something that fits is a really important thing. Um, the pad on the left here is a pad that I came up with with Dr. David Craig, who is the physician that um, adapted sentinel node biopsy from melanopa patients to breast cancer patients about, I don't know, it's probably been 30, 35, 40 years ago now. He does live in Burlington, Vermont, believe it or not. So anyways, we came up with that pad that you can see underneath the bra right there. And what it does is provide axillary compression. So that could be a carryover um, for a patient who might have a seroma up in their axilla or have swelling up in their axilla. And then if they need a little more 
support, then that's again where that axillary pillow comes in. They could get a little extra compression, a little extra movement of fluid, and then it can be maintained well with a product like this. Um, next slide is showing you one of my tricks. So you'll notice that there's a, a spiral wrapped pad up there. And I make these from Comprex 2. So, so a big rectangular Comprex 2 pad, I cut it into five strips and I'm a quilter, I admit it. I have too much fabric at my house. But anyways, what I do is I take this, this and I cut it into five pieces and then string it together. And then you have to sew around the whole piece of the rectangle because otherwise those little fingers of foam will come out. And in my clinic, you know, we have very limited time to treat patients and insurance is getting less and less in terms of what they um, reimburse us for time. And, and these patients are complicated. They, you, it's very hard to treat them quickly. And so because I'm in private practice, I can do this if I want to. I have pumps in my clinic. I spiral wrap the patient with this, which then fits everybody. So there are other products on the market that are fit to patients. And that's a really nice option for home management. Um, but for this particular process, as the patient is reducing, I can take that spiral wrap, put it up their leg, and you can see the picture below it shows the, um, the lines that are created, which again is that pressure that we talked about in the earlier slide. And what that does is that pushes a lot of fluid out and it kind of allows me to find the problem parts. Then I go in with my MLD or my fibrotic techniques and I can really take care of parts that are creating congestion. <clears throat> the patient on the right that you see there is a patient that came in that was undergoing um, chemotherapy at the time. And he was actually having chemotherapy out of state because it was complicated. And what I want you to see is that I treated that in four visits. So I took his leg from the left picture to the right picture in four visits because again, he was, he was moving um, around a lot because of his treatment needs. And I ended up using Velcro wrapped. And in four treatments, he, he was able to keep that. His wife helped him with some MLD at um, once they went back to where he was going. And the funny thing is a year later, I ran into him in Costco and I said, let me see your leg. And his leg looked the same. And he was just so happy. So understand that these are very powerful tools. And when you add pneumatic compression to some of the other tools that we have options for, you can move these patients along very quickly. And then again, that's um, available for them to use at home. So that's a real nice lead into talking about pneumatic compression and what lymphopress can do. But before we talk about lymphopress, I think it's important to clarify why compression is important and to discuss the ranges of safe and effective pressure. As always, we keep treatments in the range of patient comfort. The factors that we consider with any type of pressure used to treat fibrosis are that it needs to be enough to stretch the skin in order to remodel tissues. The patient needs to tolerate it, and the tolerance can change depending on how much time the pressure is applied, whether the pressure is constant or intermittent, whether the area of pressure is focused or broad, and how much swelling is actually in between the patient and the fibrotic tissue. So I love this picture because it shows that aquatic exercise, which we recommend for many of our lymphedema patients, uh, is it, it provides a very high amount of pressure to the body. So when we consider that lymphopress has such a wide range of treatment pressures between 20 and 90 millimeters of mercury, 90 is actually what these people have at their feet in a depth of four feet of water. So it's not a damaging amount of pressure, especially since it's so broad. These are just a few studies that I want to share with you that look at pressure and how uh, Belgrado a few years ago found that it took about 86 millimeters of mercury to be able to actually occlude lymphatics. Now keep in mind, this is a static pressure that's not on and off like intermittent pneumatic compression. So this is a pretty high amount of pressure um, and it will occlude the lymphatics if it is constant, but if you are using it on and off, and I rarely use pressures up to, to the max to 90, but I have with scum patients, and I feel confident in the safety of it because it is so intermittent. It is not creating an occlusion because it is intermittent rather than constant. Another aspect is 
whether it's a broad or a focal pressure. And this is actually a very old landmark study that was done by Eliska many years ago, looking at damage to the lymphatic system. But keep in mind, this was with a two finger focal massage. So this was not a broad pressure like being underwater or using pneumatic compression or even damaging, uh, see, even bandaging. Um, this is where you're taking two fingers and poking them into the lymphatic system. And um, so what they found was it still took up to 70 millimeters of mercury in between 70 and 100 to actually create damage. And again, um, this is with a focal pressure and using broader pressures will actually be much safer because you're dispersing the pressure. Another point is that we now have studies showing us that blood pressure readings, um, using a tourniquet to draw blood, um, there is at this point, not a lot of evidence. Um, I've had a few patients um, anecdotally have problems, but um, in these studies, they did not find any problems with the use of um, these um, medical modalities in the affected arm. So I'm not encouraging you to run out and do it, but just to say that um, if you had to have it done on an emergent basis, it's less likely to cause harm than we thought. And bandages even um, create pressure up to 64 millimeters of mercury, which again is a lot higher than I would use, use with pneumatic compression. The point of these slides is to basically say that we have a lot of research looking at what's effective, what's damaging, and what's necessary when you have fibrosis. And the higher pressures are necessary because you have to use deeper channels if the superficial lymphatics are obliterated by fibrosis. It creates new pathways. And there's no evidence of tissue damage to, with the use of pneumatic compression at these higher pressures. So to talk about you know, pneumatic compression and the way that it works, Leslie's gonna talk about two basic modes that we use. Yes, yeah, so we use sequential. Uh, there's sequential and there's peristaltic. And the sequential program um, or the se sequential compression is really, I think, well outlined by this wonderful graphic that they came up with where you can see that it fills. And it, so it fills from the bottom up, um, which is great. And then it lets go and there's a rest period right there. This is um, great for people who can tolerate distal pressure better. Um, it's a best choice for patients who have moderate to heavy fibrosis. So when you, and when you put those um, other things underneath it, like we talked about, it just exaggerates it even more, which is great. So this, uh, if a patient has sensitivity to the hand or to the lower arm, you can either pad it up, you can wrap a towel around their hand to kind of disperse that pressure a little bit better or something like that, or you can actually turn the pressure down. So that's a wonderful opportunity. So, and, and I love this uh, product because it actually covers the trunk as well. So that's very helpful. In the next slide, you'll see something that's called peristaltic uh, movement. And it's a wave-like action. So there's two chambers at a time that are turn on. And that way it gives sort of, a, it's a little more gentle, it's a little more comfortable for patients. It's still an excellent choice for fibrosis. Um, and it's best when, when you need more high proximal pressure. So some of those patients who have different cancers that will give them a more proximal swelling versus a distal swelling, this can be really helpful for. So let's talk about some specific appliances. And as Leslie said, sometimes patients have more problems with distal fibrosis. And in those cases, this um, arm sleeve appliance, it, it really focuses the treatment on the hand and the forearm and the elbow. And of course, if you had a patient who had um, breast swelling or uh, you know, uh, swelling in the thorax or axilla, you would then want to use a different appliance which would be this comfy sleeve. And this is what Leslie was referring to when she was talking about the axilla pillow or chamber, which inflates right up into the axilla. You can see that this covers from the fingertips 
down to the thorax. And um, we, this is our workhorse. This is what we use um, a lot with our breast cancer patients because it um, treats both proximally and distally. And here's the chamber that inflates right into the axilla. Our patients love it because uh, new research is showing that uh, a lot of the lymph that is drained from the upper quadrant goes into the ipsilateral axillary lymph nodes. So this really does a fantastic job of stimulating them and is great for fibrosis, for cording, for um, radiation-induced fibrosis, surgical fibrosis, and um, I just can't say enough wonderful things about this particular feature. Some of our patients are bilateral, and so we do have a jacket that can treat both arms at the same time as well as the thorax, and it feels lovely on the back. So th these are some examples of the versatility of appliances depending upon the patient need. I wanna just say a few words about how not all pumps are created equal. There are many, many different pumps out there. And Leslie and I use different pumps in our clinic, but what we find is that many of them have very limited programming or pressure ranges. And with Lumpopress, you have a wide variety of pressures from very light to very aggressive, as well as um, being the only pump that has the two different types of treatment modes, the sequential and peristaltic. In some cases, some pumps will only treat an arm or a leg, and there's no option for the trunk or abdomen. And as you can see, you have many, many options. Lymphopress's appliances are particularly easy to put on, unlike other appliances, which I've had a lot of patients who have gotten other pumps and they just have not used them. They've sat in the closet because they can't get them on. They don't fit very well. They're not comfortable to wear. And with Lymphopress, it inflates to fit. And so you're getting a reliable treatment every time, easy to put on, um, great treatment. In some cases, pumps have long cycle times and short pause times, which can actually create pain, especially if you have the sequential programming that sustains the pressure at the hand. And Lymphopress has a shorter cycle time and longer pause times relatively, which create a lot of comfort. Also, Lymphopress has fantastic deflation in between cycles. And remember when we were talking about damaging pressures, it's really important to not have pressure the whole time, especially if you're using high pressures. You want it to be intermittent and you want to have a good deflation so you don't have a tourniquet effect. Many of our patients already have a lot of pain. And so we want to really find ways to reduce that pain. The other nice thing about the deflation is that it helps with edema uptake. And so Lymphopress by deflating almost fully allows for the lymph fluid to rush back into the channels and to be um, taken up um, through the use of the sequential pressure. Lymphopress also is one of the very few pumps out there that has appliances with overlapping chambers, which mimic bandaging. And when you don't have overlapping pressures, you get uneven pressure. You get pressure in the middle of the chamber, um, but there can be dead spots. So these are just a few examples of how Lymphopress has taken all the different possibilities of configurations and put together the best of the best. So I feel so um, confident using Lymphopress with my breast cancer patients because of all of these wonderful qualities. So to sum it up, Lymphopress helps you decongest swelling, but the higher pressures will help to soften and remodel the hardened fibrotic tissues as well. And when we get softer tissues, we have less obstruction to lymphatic circulation, and it increases spontaneous lymphatic circulation, which ultimately helps us have better management of lymphedema, lipedema, and fibrosis. And to sum it up, just another picture of a patient right here. This is one of my patients, and you can see the breast edema and the scar 
And after six visits, look how good she looks. I mean, everything loosened up and, you know, using a pump up in that axilla really helped to keep the fluid out. And uh, she didn't actually need one for home use, but this is just another example of, of the good work that we can do and how happy we can make our patients. And uh, we'd like to thank you very much for uh, visiting with us today. And we look forward to addressing some of your questions now. Karen, do you have any other final comments? No, I just, I love this picture, Leslie, because it really shows graphically what we can do to help with um, treating our fibrotic tissue. So away we go with some questions. Thank you both so much for an incredible presentation. As always, you both are so wonderful to, to learn from. Um, we've got a lot of great questions from the audience, both from the Q&A box and the chat box. So I'm gonna start with our Q&As before moving to chat. Marie Josie Green asked, can someone have quote, lymphedema and or fibrosis from preventative bilateral mastectomies? And then in parentheses, no lymph nodes taken out. So if one of you'd wanna adjust that. Wow. I, I would say that I have a lot of patients who have zero lymph nodes removed who do end up with lymphedema and fibrosis. It has nothing to do with um, how many lymph nodes are removed. It has to do with uh, a lot of different inflammatory factors and fibrotic factors. So uh, I have patients with 22 lymph nodes removed who never get lymphedema. And then I also have patients with zero lymph nodes removed who have massive problems. And there are so many factors. I mean, some that I see uh, are body mass, skill of the surgeon, post-surgical course, uh, how well we can get a handle on the post-surgical swelling and, and um, help it uh, not develop into lymphedema. What would you say, Leslie? I would say, and there also can be predisposed to swelling. So there's genetic factors that predispose patients to swelling. So we don't, they all don't come with instructions. So we don't know which ones um, have those factors. So I would say, that we can't just assume that someone who's had a, either a prophylactic treatment or a very minimal cancer treatment is actually gonna be free of these problems. And they could ha actually have scarring and fibrosis even without big lymphedema. So I would say that we need to watch them. That's fascinating. Well, thank you. And thanks Marie Josie for your question. Um, Bridget Asbury wants to know if you could talk about the effects of diuretics on lymphedema. That's a good question. I found that um, some, some patients, do, well, first of all, in general, we don't, we don't advocate diuretics for lymphedema. Although I've had a few patients who have more of the primary types of, types of lymphedema who have actually done okay or feel better with some diuretics. So I don't write them off completely, but um, it's not usually our first go-to. Karen, got any other ideas on that one? Yeah, the problem with diuretics is that they remove the fluid, but they leave the solids. And yeah. so that predisposes people towards fibrosis because of the excess solids in the tissues. So um, yeah, I agree with you, Leslie. I mean, there are times like if someone has hypertension, um, a diuretic might be a good choice for treating the hypertension and might help the lymphedema also. But um, there are in my opinion, too many doctors who prescribe diuretics for lymphedema where they should be prescribing lymphedema treatment. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Ann Van Herk had more of a comment. She said, um, we used to have pressures a lot lower with lymphatics closing at uh, less than 40 mmHg. So. so I would love to see any research on that because um, I, I am a research nerd, so is Leslie. And, um, and if you have any studies that show that, ah, please send them to me because I'd love to incorporate them into my presentations. But um, what I did find was that it took a lot higher amounts of pressure to actually uh, occlude the lymphatics. So um, uh, bring it on. Great. <laughs> Um, now, in the chat, we had two questions about laser. So Emily Stallings wanted to know which brand of low-level laser to use in your clinic, and Bridget Asbury asked if LLL low-level laser is the same as cold laser. So a bit of a two-part. Um, the answer is yes, that is the same. 
Um, the laser that, that Karen and I use the most is a Reancorp laser. It's out of Australia. It's the little handheld unit. Um, the nice thing about it is that it doesn't require goggles. So many of the lasers out there because of the bouncing of the beams require that you're in a closed room and that you have goggles on. Um, this does not require because it has a filter at the end. So if the, if the uh, laser touches the skin, then you're getting penetration of that, of that beam of about two and a half plus centimeters. It's two and a half centimeters of a pretty high um, dose, but then it, it reduces. So it can actually go much deeper than that. So that's the one we use. And it's, that's the one that's been FDA cleared here in the U.S. Great. If anybody has more questions offline, you're welcome to contact me. I'm happy to answer questions about that. Yeah, and by the way, Leslie is someone um, to contact if you're interested in trying a laser in your clinic because um, she has a bunch of demo lasers that um, people can use for a month. And that's how I started using laser was I got a demo and used it on all my patients. There's um, no contraindications. The only precaution is pregnancy. Um, and don't stick it in your eye. Yeah. And you can't, you can't really hurt people with this. All of my patients loved it. I did a retrospective patient satisfaction survey and my hospital foundation ended up buying eight lasers um, over time because um, nobody wants to share. It is just so powerful. It's such a wonderful tool, especially for fibrosis. I have four of them in my clinic. So that's really, and sometimes I go two fisted. So if I have a larger mm -hmm. fibrotic area that I'm trying to treat, I'll be beeping them with two of them. So Give me a call if you have some questions. One thing about laser is that um, you cannot bill for it as a standalone modality. So um, Leslie is the one who developed the myofascial laser technique where you can use the laser as a myofascial instrument. Yeah, wiggling it. Wiggle it and educate at the same time. And then you're, you're providing you know, excellent quality service to your patient. Well, Maureen Garrity had a question specifically for you, Karen, around page I think it was around page or slide 42, if I'm referencing correctly, but you mentioned creating new pathways and Maureen wants to know if you can explain a bit further about creating new, new lymphatic pathways. Well, um, we, we know that, um, that we do have um, lymphangiogenesis when there's destruction of the lymphatic system. And so that is something that happens um, with or without help. Um, one thing in some of the, um, the studies, one of the studies I cited, um, Olczewski talks about um, creating deep channels where you're actually moving fluid through interstitial space. So that's a couple of examples of ways that you can um, reroute lymph um, away from the damaged areas. Great, thank you. Um, all right. We have, there's lots, lots of chatter. Um, we had a lot of conversation about the Mobiderm um, garments and bandages. Um, would you two, I know Leslie, you popped in the chat too a little bit talking about it. Um, would you wanna discuss a little bit about the, the roles that they're- Yeah, about? I mean, I think that, that was a great option that they, that they came up with. Um, they're not as, they don't last as long because it's actually put together with that uh, tape. What's the tape called? Surgical tape. So it's, it's not, it doesn't quite last long. It's a great option for patients to use at home. Um, but with the, with the jelly rolls that I make from the LNR uh, Comprex too, I just throw them in the washer and the dryer after each use with a patient. And those things last forever. So you really want to look at the density of the foam. And if the foam flattens really quickly and easily, and it's not very dense, then you're not going to get as aggressive a treatment. And so, um, and again, I've been using these for about 15 years. So I've, I've used some of the, the products uh, from um, Twain, which are good. And again, they're more recently available in the United States, but I'm very used to using the ones from LNR that I can throw in and out of the washing machine multiple times. It's good to have options. Yeah, it's good to have options. Um, Nora Bird wants to know if you have any recommendations for nighttime garments for fibrotic breast. <laughs> Oh yeah, so there, there are a number of products out there. Um, again, I'm quite familiar with the ones that are created by Joby Pack because I helped create a whole bunch of them. So using, um, but the, the big key with that is you've got to have compression over the top. And again, compression that fits. So depending, you want more of a short stretch type of compression, which is what I tried to create in the Belize bra, which is why there's three layers of fabric is you want a more, I also call it container compression versus stretchy, squeezy compression. And that's gonna be more helpful. I will often have patients wear the bra 
or some compression, chest compression with the pad to bed, because that's a great way for them to um, start to break up some of this fibrosis because they roll around in bed all night and that's even extra pressure just from laying on it. So that's a, that's a good question. And um, yes, there are lots of products. There's lots of different shapes. Many of the companies have different shapes of products. So uh, just look at them. Some of them are a little bulkier than others. Sometimes I have a patient who needs to wear it during the day. I might even make them a chip pad. So I still cut up the orange foam and the gray foam and stick it between the tape. So that's something that's a little more flat. Sometimes I'll take an old garment, like an old Solidea garment or a Bioflect garment that has the texture to it and I'll cut it up and they can wear that inside of their bra um, or a compression chest wall product, whatever they're using. So there's lots of options there for patients. There's really no one more innovative than lymphedema patients and therapists, I feel like, <laughs> when it comes to treatment. Yeah. Um, Leanne St. John wants to know, have you used cupping? We love yes. cupping. Love cupping, use it all love the time. Cupping. Yeah. So that was one of the um, modalities that we whizzed by. And again, if we had three days to talk to you as opposed to one hour, we would go into great um, detail on negative pressure. And um, there's a lot of evidence about negative pressure, um, both cupping and um, uh, different um, mechanical devices that can create graded negative pressure. They can add vibration. Um, oh my gosh, it is a very, very effective treatment, but it's also pretty aggressive. So it's one of those um, things where you need to know what you're doing and, um, and use a lot of caution. But it's really helpful with negative pressure to be able to change the direction of pull. So in, in, uh, when we do our myofascial techniques, we're doing a translational type of movement where we're stretching it sideways. Sometimes, especially over port scars, you want to just pull it out and start to increase pressure or not pressure, increase movement or decrease pressure by that negative pressure component. So it's a, it's a really wonderful option. I use it on deep um, creases on patients who have those scarred creases that are sometimes folded inside of the edema. Very helpful. And I like to use it kind of in a rotational, so you're almost creating a torquing action because not only does that lift, like Leslie says, um, but you're also starting to create even more angles of stretch. And um, like you say, with those port scars, those can be, um, and drain scars, um, they can be even worse than the surgical scar. And drain scars, are, and patients never forget the drain. When you mm -hmm. talk to them a year later, and there's a little PTSD that happens with that. Yeah, but I think a little laser and a little cupping and um, you know, maybe some taping. Actually, yep. I use a lot of paper tape, especially when the drain scars aren't really, you know, very mature and they're pulling and they're annoying. And they're remodeling at that point yeah. in time. And so they get tight very quickly. We really want to influence them because ultimately um, you, you need the scar because it what it's what knits the skin together, but you want to influence the scar so that it's soft and supple and flexible. Right. And remember too that the scars go different directions. So I have a patient with a um, with pain in her chest wall, and it's actually when her breast is pendulous. She does not have pain if you lift it up. And she didn't actually know that because when she compressed it with a bra, it didn't change her pain because they weren't lifting the pendulous tissue. So now I'm working with this patient and I'm pulling the scar down so that she has increased length of that scar in a pendulous position. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and if anyone, it's 1.30. So if anyone is jumping off, we will be sending a recording of this after. So you won't miss any of the, of the Q&A goodies um, as we continue. So just know that you'll, you'll get a recording in a few days, but we're gonna continue because we have a lot more questions. Um, Sergey Grish Grishenkov wants to know, are there any objective tools for detection and assessment of fibrosis? Absolutely. Uh -huh. But um, not a lot of clinics have them because some of them can be pretty pricey. Um, there, I have a whole lecture that just talks about um, different tools that are used for that. In our clinic, we're lucky enough to have a handheld ultrasound. And so uh, it also has the ability for um, elastography and um, you can look at the actual density of tissues as well as um, you know, kind of um, imaging um, down inside um, to see uh, what's happening with the scar and the fascia and, and interstitial space and all of 
that. MRI is, um, man, if very few places, mostly teaching hospitals have access to that, but that is um, probably, um, would you say, Leslie, one of the definitive ways to measure it? And then, um, you know, there's some tools out there that measure the ability to depress tissue. So that would be like a tonometer. Um, and um, those aren't as useful unless you're also looking at the swelling because the elasticity of the tissue can vary depending on whether you're a water balloon because you can have very low extensibility if there's a lot of fluid there or you can have low extensibility if you have a hard scar. So it's really important to understand the quality of the tissues. And so using um, tools that um, can help you um, measure the amount of swelling as well as looking at extensibility, you kind of have to put them together to, to really make them effective. The other thing to remember too, is that the insurance companies are not most, I have never had an insurance company, company back, come back to me and make me prove the amount of fibrosis or scarring that I was treating. So as much as it's really nice to be able to quantify that, I think if you use the mild, moderate to severe, you know, as part of your documentation to describe it, if you can describe it, maybe you can measure the width of it. There are lots of ways that you can, you can document this in such a way that it becomes um, not a problem for insurance reimbursement. Yeah, and ultimately insurances are looking at function anyway. So with Leslie's patient that had the cording who couldn't raise her arm above 90 degrees of shoulder abduction, um, you know, Leslie was able to document that she could reach overhead, she could reach things from high shelves, she could get dressed. Um, you know, those are things that express the changes in function because we're changing the fibrosis. Great. Thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, is it safe to recommend a patient use a compression pump even with active chemotherapy? Chemotherapy is not a contraindication for pneumatic compression. And uh, the only caveat that I would say is that um, if you're having IV chemo, on the days that you have the chemo, you're gonna have a higher fluid load. So if you're doing pneumatic compression on a daily basis, <clears throat> the chemo days, <clears throat> you may need to break the treatments into a couple of treatments or do shorter treatments because your bladder is going to fill up faster. But um, pneumatic compression is not contraindicated for um, chemo or active cancer. Thank you. Um, Kathy Plavkan wants to know if either of you have heard of using a biomat during MLD. It utilizes infrared. I have. I don't have one, so I've, I've not used one in my clinic, but I know that some people use it and some patients find it really helpful. I think that light therapy is something that um, adds that super sauce to treatment. And so <clears throat> as um, some biomats, though, with the red light therapy do have thermal effects. So I have a biomat at home that I use personally, but I don't bring it into my clinic just because with a lot of my patients, they um, it's not appropriate to use thermal modalities. So it really depends. It, it you know varies from patient to patient. Um, Catherine Melnick had a question earlier in the presentation. You mentioned six day results and she wanted to know, is that with pump use only or is it a result of CDT and other compression? Other well? components. It's, it's, I, I wouldn't get that kind of result with any one particular modality. So that was using all the tools I had at my disposal. So that was probably using laser bandaging, self MLD, pump in the clinic with my spiral wraps. Um, and then, um, you know, having the patient work, work at home with some exercises. So it would be the whole thing. But the point is, is that we were able to move the fluid much more quickly because we added the component of pump at the very beginning. So it just speeds up the process for them. And I would say that we're starting to get more and more patients who have limited insurance coverage where we're being yeah. asked to treat this patient in six visits. And that's a big reason why we're doing this presentation is because Leslie and I love having effective tools. And we like having a variety of tools so that we can use them in combination with each other and find the tools that are most effective for each patient that really work for them. And 
some of these tools are tools that we even give to our patients to use at home after they've completed treatment. Because sadly, the days of being able to treat patient on a daily basis for a month aren't possible with every single patient. And so we challenge ourselves to become even more effective and to be able to help our patients. Plus, we want to move through this process as quickly as possible for our patients' sake. We want people to be able to get out of that um, heavy congestion um, and be more functional, be happier, um, you know, put cancer and all of the side effects and residual effects, including lymphedema and fibrosis, put it in the rearview mirror so that people can get on with life. We love that. Um, Jenny Proctor, or Jeannie Proctor had another question. Uh, what pressures do you recommend for leg lymphedema or lipedema? I'm assuming with the pumps, perhaps. So I recommend all kinds of pressures, but it depends on the patient. Mm -hmm. So it really isn't something where I can give you a specific pressure without actually knowing the patient. And um, uh, I, I have um, uh, published some information about um, pressure ranges for different diagnoses. And um, that's something that we can make available to you if you're interested. Uh, I would say that uh, if a patient has a lot of pain or sensitivity, I will go down to 20. I'll go down to the lowest amount because if that's what they tolerate, they're still going to get some effective treatment. <clears throat> but likewise, I've also had patients uh, in the slide that showed you the pit packs where there's an arm pit pack that is actually, um, that was made for one of my patients and we used 90 on her arm because she is obese. She has heavy fibrosis in her arm and her thorax and she relies on the high pressure plus the pit pack to be able to keep her tissues soft. We have a comment here from an anonymous attendee who says, that their CLT passed away and they are learning new ways with a new CLT. Why is there no basic common explanations? After six years with my dear CLT, meeting a new CLT is such a setback. What can I as a patient do to improve this new relationship? Hmm. I'm sorry for your loss because I know we form close relationships with our providers and it's always a shock to, to lose someone that we're close to. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the patient therapist relationship, it's so individual. And I think that we have the skill sets, but we also just have the way that we connect as human beings. And I would look at both of those factors and know that there are lots of different providers out there and that um, sometimes, especially if you have grown accustomed to a certain relationship and a certain way of, of being, that it may be harder to start up with a new person. And I would give it a chance, but if it doesn't feel like you're meshing or connecting, uh, I would seek a second opinion and see if there's another person out there that you have a better connection with or has a different tool set. I would say that the, the things that we've been talking about in this lecture today are very advanced. And as a rule, you are not going to find um, therapists doing every single one of these modalities. Um, Leslie and I are pretty unique in that we are always trying to grab new tools. We wanna to be as effective as possible, but there are plenty of lymphedema therapists who never go beyond the, the basic training. So just because you have a lymphedema therapist doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have exactly the same bags of tricks with every person. And um, that's why we feel like it's so important to offer this to, to everyone, to be able to spread the word that there are all kinds of really wonderful treatments out there that can um, make a huge difference. Thanks, Karen. Um, Leslie, I have to speaking say of, goodbye. Yeah. I have patients waiting. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks, Leslie. Lovely. Let's do this again. Yay! <laughs> um, great. Well, let's see. We have more questions coming in, too. This is, this is great. Um, 
So Bonnie Hageman says she was issued a lymphopress for arm only, and then her clinic closed and her therapist failed to order the machine that includes thoracic compression. Medicare refuses to address the need and she must wait four more years for a new machine. What can I do for my thorax in the meantime, as I cannot afford out of pocket new machine? Well, I'll let you go first, Karen. Yeah, okay. Well, first off, um, all the lymphopress machines work with appliances for either arms or legs or um, pantsuits or jackets like you saw. So if you have the machine, it just sounds like you need a different appliance. And the appliances are much less expensive than getting a whole new machine. Um, having said that, I don't just set my patients loose with a lymphopress. I have them doing manual lymphatic drainage as well. And so uh, before and even during treatment, I'll have patients work their supraclavicular fossa. I'll have them work their deep abdominals. Um, I'll have them um, often doing um, all kinds of different stimulation depending upon their needs. So if you have an arm sleeve, that's great because you've got a workhorse that can help your arm. And I would make sure that you get with a therapist who can give you a very effective program for decongesting your axilla, um, your, your, your whole thoracic area. And it's very, very possible. It just means more work on your part if you have to do the manual work um, instead of having the jacket. So I would weigh whether you wanted to um, go for a jacket um, private pay or whether you wanted to put the work in to do the manual work. But if you do have proximal swelling, you do need to do one or the other. Um, you really don't want to use an arm only sleeve because that's pushing the fluid up to the axilla, um, which is great, but you want to be addressing the rest of the affected areas. And as far as lymphopress goes, you know, we love to work with and advocate for patients as much as possible. So please reach out to us. Um, when we send the follow-up email, you can just respond and we can connect you with someone, a local compression consultant who can maybe talk to you because you, you might not have to wait that long for a new machine too. We, we like to, to advocate and help patients get the pumps that they need. So we'll try and, and help you out, Bonnie. Um, Kathy Plavkin says, great presentation. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> um, does serapeptase or natokinase soften fibrosis? I might be pronouncing those incorrectly. I've had success with a medical massage therapist collaboratively with hands only in breaking up surface netting, surface netting like material, which I think of as cross-linked proteins and also deeper fibrosis. Has held, have others supplemented during, have others supplemented during pandemic hiatus with vibrating foam roller massage gun? Uh -huh. Yeah, so there's all sorts of things. And like I said, you know, if we had three days, I could talk about proteolytic enzymes and supplements and things that help on a cellular level. And um, I know that natokinase has been identified as, as well as serapeptase, as well as other types of supplements that can be helpful. And a lot of people uh, like to use these post-surgery to influence fibrosis on a cellular level. So rather than just run out and grab these though, I would strongly suggest that you work with someone who is knowledgeable about this because um, some supplements have some contraindications. So rather than just starting yourself on a supplement, I think you need to take the whole picture into effect in terms of uh, you know, any medications that you're on where there's interactions with supplements. Um, very important to have guidance with that. But um, yes, I definitely utilize um, proteolytic enzymes and other supplements um, to help with um, the, the internal effects on fibrosis. Thank you. All right, well, um, I think that was all of the questions. Um, Karen, thank you so much for an incredible presentation. Leslie, in spirit, thank you too. Um, we just all really enjoyed it and learned so much today. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with before we wrap it up? Sure. And I want to just say, those of you who are still here, I mean, it looks like we still have a significant number of people. So thank you for staying to the bitter end. Um, 
Leslie and I could talk about this all day because there are so many, many, many different ways to treat fibrosis. But I'm especially happy to be talking about lymphopress because I feel that lymphopress is such a powerful treatment for fibrosis. And I think in terms of um, the, the fact that it's covered by so many insurances, it really enables patients to be very independent in managing their lymphedema symptoms and helping with fibrosis. I talked a little bit about how uh, I will have patients come back into the clinic to do tune-ups periodically. So I might initially see a patient for a few weeks or a few months, depending upon their need. But if there's someone that is um, in the early window of healing from surgery and radiation fibrosis, I may suggest to them come back in six months or a year so we can see what's going on. What I've found is the patients that I have who have lymphopress devices generally have fewer problems down the road because lymphopress is so effective in mechanically helping to remodel the fibrosis and to evacuate the swelling. And really in a nutshell, what we want to do is to empower our patients to be able to manage their own lymphedema and fibrosis symptoms, to be able to put these problems in remission. Because after breast cancer, I mean, breast cancer, it can be a very traumatic part of a woman's life, and some men as well. And really, if we can help people get their power back and be able to have the power to change their bodies, then I think that's, we're, we're doing well if we can do that. If anyone watching, we're getting some comments from people who say that they love their lymphopress as well. But if you don't have a lymphopress or you'd like more information, please reach out to us. As mentioned, you know, we love to connect and, and help people and, um, you know, work with you about getting a pump. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, thank you to Karen and Leslie for sharing their, their knowledge and expertise and their, their Halloween spirit as well with their costumes. <laughs> Um, and we had a we had a wonderful time. So thank you all so much for for being here. And keep an eye out for the follow up email with the recording. Thanks again. Bye everybody.